But I wanna jump in today because we're in a series called Tough Prayers. Now there's a guy named Richard Foster. He wrote a book called The Celebration of Discipline. And here's what he says about prayer, the discipline of prayer. Of all of the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the most central because it ushers us into perpetual communion with the Father. Meaning, when we pray, we get to enter into the presence of God, the Father, the creator, the sustainer of life, and we get to have communion, actual conversation with God where he hears and listens and answers us. Think about that opportunity that we have to approach the God of the universe and talk to him, and it's open to every single one of us. Now, the last two weeks have been incredible. Anybody thankful that Pastor CJ has some pretty awesome friends? I mean, Pastor Travis and Pastor Mark, those two messages were incredible. If you haven't watched those on prayer, you need to go on YouTube and check those out because they were incredible. And today, well, Pastor CJ isn't here, so I want to let you know what's going on. Pastor CJ, um, well, so let me give you some history. Over 18 years ago, Northview Church started a missional church plant on the near east side of Indianapolis called Brookside Community Church. And out of that church, a CDC, a community development corporation, is launched as well. They offer a food pantry, uh, housing initiatives, partnership with School 54 for reading programs, after school programs, tutoring programs, as well as uh, re entry programs for those that were incarcerated or faced homelessness or addiction. Northview Church, over the last 18 years, we have given millions of dollars to see Jesus become famous and to see restoration happen on the near east side of Indianapolis. And that's been amazing. And today, from my understanding, the first time uh, a senior pastor of Northview Church is actually giving the message at Brookside Community Church on a Sunday morning, uh, which is an awesome thing. So we're celebrating that Pastor CJ was able to do that. But that means you were stuck with me. So... Sorry about that, but we're gonna jump into tough prayers anyway, and we're gonna be focusing on Mark chapter nine. So if you have your Bibles, you'll wanna open up to Mark chapter nine for today. As you're doing that, I gotta ask you a question. Have you ever been in a place where you were like, man, if I never have to leave here, that would be okay. I don't really wanna go back to normal life. As I was preparing for this message, it was two weeks ago, we were on our family vacation. We were out in Lake Tahoe, California, and I was like, you know what, if I didn't have to go back to Indiana, maybe this would be the place that I would just stay. You know, I'm on the beach and uh, the bluest of blue water and the bluest of blue skies and the, the general store had this ice cream sandwich and the title of it was just called It's It. And you're like, what is this? And I was, it's just it. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it describes itself. It's that kind of a sandwich. And it's just perfection and you're like, oh man, do I really have to go back to Indiana? Well, as we open Mark chapter nine, we have a moment like that where the disciples say, do we really have to keep going? Can we just stop? I wanna read it to you. So Mark chapter nine, verses two through four, and then skip into verse seven, it says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There, he, meaning Jesus, was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud and said, this is my son, whom I love, listen to him. So here's the moment. Jesus picks his three favorite disciples. The rest of you, he says, sorry about you. You're not making the hike with us. We're going up the mountain. And these disciples in that moment get to see Jesus for who he really is. He is transfigured and they see the total glory of Jesus for the very first time. All the way up until this point, they knew he was special. They knew he was different. They knew he was something. In fact, just chapters before, Jesus says to them, who do the people say I am? And they say, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Moses. Some say you're a great prophet. He says, yeah, but who do you say I am? And they say, we say you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And so in their head, they had this knowledge that they were following God's son, the Messiah. But in this moment on the mountain, 
they had no more doubts because they actually get to witness and see the glory of God. And they're standing in the glory of God and it's perfect. And so Peter, he has a pretty good idea. He says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter's like, let's never go back. Let's just stay here forever because this is awesome, right? We are in the presence of basically heaven because we're in the glory of God. And Jesus is like, oh, no, no, no. We're, we're gonna go back. And I think Peter's like, but if we go down the mountain, there's people there. And people are annoying. What if we just don't, you know? What if we just stayed here in perfection? And here's the thing I want you to know. As believers in Christ, the Bible is clear that one day we will be in heaven. And in that heaven, it will be perfection. There will be no pain, no hurt, no crying. We will be in God's glory. There will be no worries, no stress, no disease. There will be people, but they'll be not annoying. It will be amazing. And we will be in perfection. But Jesus says, we can't stay here. Our mission isn't done. We have to go back down the mountain. We have to go back down to where God has wired us to do something here on this earth. And I would say the same thing to you. Maybe you've been in a place where you've had communion with God and said, this is perfect. But guess what? God is calling you to do something with your life. He has gifted you with gifts, talents, abilities, experiences, and he has called you to use those to bring his kingdom. If you're a follower of Christ, your responsibility now is to use those gifts to bring God's kingdom here to this earth through what you can do by using what God has given you. But in that, here's the other part. When we live in a fallen world, we have fallen problems. That means every one of us remains broken. None of us are perfect. And we live in a broken world where we're still gonna face disease and hurt and broken relationship and addiction. And so we have real problems. But Jesus, he gives us this promise and he says, hey, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So the disciples, they can go down the mountain and they can face whatever's ahead because they know they have God the glory of God with them now. They 100% know who he is. But here's the confidence that you can have. Jesus told us that when he left the earth that he gave us a gift called the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit resides in those of us who believe so that as we walk, we have the power of God living inside of us. Do you believe that and understand that? So as you walk through a world with trouble, you have the power of God within you. You need to know that. But let's see what happens when they come down the mountain. It says when they came To the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Imagine that, the annoying people fighting. That's how it goes. So they come down, it's happening. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. Well, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion He fell at the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus asked. Everything is possible for the one who believes. This man He comes and he's like, Jesus, if you could do it, if you could do anything, can you help me? And Jesus is like, if I can't, do you know who you're talking to? I guess that's the question I have for you, Northview. Do you know when you come in prayer who you're talking to? Do you know who he is? You know, a similar question was asked of God in the book of Exodus So we got Moses, and God comes to Moses, and he gives him a huge challenge. He says, hey, Moses, you are going to go to Egypt, 
and my Israelites are in slavery in Egypt, and you need to come, and you are going to help release them from Egypt out of slavery and lead them to the promised land. And Moses says, not me. He says, yes, you. And over a lot of convincing, he finally says, yes. And finally, Moses relents. But then he asks God a pretty weird question. Check this out. He says, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? Like Moses comes and says, what if, what if they ask me what your name is? What do I tell them? Why is, did G- Moses care what his name was? Because your name is your identifier. It identifies who you are and what you can do. This man comes to Jesus and says, if you're able, like what are you capable of? Moses says, if I go to the Israelites and I tell them that God has sent me, they're gonna go, is he able to do what you're telling us he can do? Is he really gonna save us? What's his name? You see, because as they believed in gods and understood different pagan gods, each god had a different ability and their name signified what they could do. So next week, we're gonna start talking about Ephesus. And in Ephesus, there was a god named Artemis. Her temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. But Artemis, well, she was the god of fertility. So if you wanted to have a child, it would be great if you could travel to Ephesus to go to the temple of Artemis where you could worship the goddess Artemis, buy one of her shrines, take it home, worship it in your home because she was the one that had the power to give you a child. Or if you needed it to rain because you were a farmer and you needed crops, well, you could worship Baal because his name signified that he was the god of dew and rain and you could go and you could worship him and therefore that god had the power to do that, but that's all the power he had, but he was the right one to go to for that specific need in your life. And today, today we still worship pagan gods. You know, this weekend, there was a moment in the Olympics that caused a lot of stir amongst the world and brought the Lord's Supper into a conversation across the entire world. It was a moment in the Olympics where whatever it was, but there was this group of drag queens who were around the table. And Pastor CJ and I were talking about that moment. And you know, one of the things that I continue to see is Christians saying, well, can't anybody worship God? And the answer is, of course, of course. It's not who worships God, it's what God are you worshiping? And in that moment, there was a blue man that was lowered down onto the table. He was a blue naked man. And it was actually the Greek goddess that was lowered down, representation of Greek goddess uh, Dionysus, who is the god of wine or the god of pleasure. And it was a moment of worshiping pleasure. Can I tell you, that god had one power, but that god actually has no power because he's no god at all. There is only one God. You know who the God of pleasure is? Well, he's the creator of the universe who gave us the ability of pleasure. And we don't just worship pleasure. We worship every aspect of who he is. And so Moses, he comes to God and he says, suppose I come and they ask, what's your name? What is your name? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. What does that mean? What does the name I am mean? Well, here's what it means. I am is the ultimate statement of self-sufficiency, self-existence, and immediate presence. God's existence is not contingent upon anyone else. His plans are not contingent upon any circumstances. His promises, he just says, I promise that I will be what I will be. That is, he will eternally and consistently be God. He stands ever present, unchangeable, completely sufficient in himself to do as he wills and to accomplish what he wills to accomplish. When you say, who is God? You just say, well, he is. It's like the it's, it's of sandwiches. When you wanna know who is God, he is. So here's a question. When you go to God and say, hey, God, who is the creator of the universe? He goes, I am. Who, God, who sustains all life? I am. God, who's the God who can, who can heal me and help me have a child? I am. I'm the God of fertility. Who's the God of pleasure? I am. Who's the God who provides the rain? I am. Who's the alpha? I am. Who's the omega? I am. Who's the beginning and the end, the sustainer of all life? I am. There are no other gods. You should place no other gods before me, and you should only worship one and only God, and that is me. And so this guy, he comes to Jesus, and he says, if you are able, and Jesus is like, are you kidding me? 
Do you know who you're talking to? And when you come with that tough prayer that you have in your personal life, you need to approach God understanding who he is. He's the great I am. And anything that you bring to him, he says, yes, I can take that for you because that's who I am. So then it says, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes in the man's immediate response then is, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. What is that? It's a statement of faith. When you come in prayer, you come to God in a moment of faith. God, I know who you are, but I see no way for this to be possible. Help me, God. I'm presenting this to you. Help me overcome my unbelief in this situation. Help me, God. I know you can, but I I still have these doubts. I'm coming in faith. Would you do what only you can do? And this weekend, I shared a story that I have not shared uh, publicly, and I'll talk to you in a moment why I haven't done it, but I felt like God was telling me today's the day to share it. So my personality, um, I'm I'm pretty calm, even keel. I don't carry a lot of anxiety and stress. I don't know why. God wired me that way. I know God didn't wire all of us that way, but I don't normally feel a lot of anxiety. But about 13 years, all right, 14 years ago now, my daughter's 13, my wife came to me and said, hey, I'm pregnant, which was amazing with our second child. But in that moment, I experienced so much fear and anxiety I'd never had before in my life. And I became convinced that something was wrong with my child, and I just knew in my spirit. I never told my wife, Brooke. But I prayed every single day, God, would you heal my child? Would you heal my child? Would you heal my child? About five months into the pregnancy, we got that phone call from the doctor that said, hey, we we have a test result. Um, we set up an appointment with a specialist in two weeks that you guys will need to come to. We won't give you any details over the phone. Just, just don't worry and come in two weeks, which when a doctor says, hey, come in two weeks and don't worry, it's something with your child. You're like, that makes no sense. Um, just say, hey, why don't you worry for the next two weeks and we'll see you then. Uh, so so um, on Tuesdays at the Carmel campus, there's a prayer ministry that happens in our chapel. And so I went to that Tuesday night prayer, and I gathered with this group, and I told them, hey, I've been praying this. I've been feeling this. Um, I'm just praying that God would heal my child, and I'm asking that you would agree in prayer. And we prayed. And as soon as we were done, uh, one of the guys in the prayer group, he walked up to me, and he said, hey, Kurt, I need to tell you, while we were praying, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, what you're praying for is real, and you need to have as many people praying as possible. So the next day here at work at church, I committed the cardinal sin of any workplace. I hit reply all on an email. (laughs) I changed the subject title to prayer, and I said, if you would, would you join me for lunch and pray? So the staff comes down, and we, we were praying together, and I just said, just pray that God would heal my child. We go in two weeks to find out what's going on, but I'm just praying that God would heal my child. So we prayed. We get done. There's a woman on our staff who's an incredible prayer warrior, and She comes over to me and she says, "Uh, hey, Kurt, as we were praying, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, what you're praying for is real. And you need to have as many people praying as possible. Now, I'm not a very smart person. But when I hear something twice, and it's attributed to the Lord from two different people, I'm going to pay attention. And so I'm asking everybody I know, pray, pray. She also said, hey, Um, I keep a prayer journal, and whenever I feel like I hear from the Lord, I write it down. And I don't know that God will answer me, but I'm going to be praying every day up until your appointment. And whatever God says, good or bad, I promise you I will write it down and I will bring it to you. But the day before our appointment, I parked my car one morning, and she comes running across the parking lot. And she's got this in her hands, this note. And it's, uh, I'm going to read it to you. It comes from May 26, 2010. It says, the Lord says... I have those whom you pray for. Now, what did we say God's name was? I am. I want you to listen to some of these I am statements. I am in control, and all life is in my hands. I am the creator of all life, and I take care of my creation. I am fixed upon my children. Trust in me, trust in me, trust in me. 
I will never release myself from your grasp. I am with you, and I am a prayer answer. So the next day we go into this appointment. I had a little confidence in my pocket. and We go in, they say, do you know why you're here? And you know, we said, no, we, we don't know exactly, but we know there's something potentially wrong with our child. And they said, well, yeah. And they said, now, if she would have, um, your wife would have tested like one in 200 and something. She would have flagged for further testing. But we want you to know, coming to this appointment, that your results, it was much higher. And we're fairly confident that your child has some, some things going on with it. So we want you to meet with a counselor before we go and do further testing. And so we sat through an hour with a counselor. And then we went into testing. And as we did our testing, it was healthy, 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 healthy. And I... Some people have told me, you know, well, it was, could it have just been a false test? And I would say, oh, you don't know my God. And so I share that story. Share that story because I believe when God does a miracle, you need to give glory where glory deserves to be given. <laughs> Yet at the same time, what's caused me hesitation to share that story is because I never want somebody to believe that God has answered all of my prayers, nor that I get every answer I want. And I recognize that in a room like this and many campuses, there are many people who pray fervently and don't get the same answer. And I called a family in our church who I know are prayer warriors. And I said to them, hey, I'm, I'm gonna share this story this weekend. And I know that in a couple different situations, you have prayed and prayed and prayed and did not get the answer that you were hoping for. How will this feel if I were to share this? And this family, they're so full of faith and so amazing. And they said, oh, we'll be fine because here's what we know. I think many people think God either answers yes or he answers no. And sometimes he does. But there's a third way that God answers prayers. And sometimes he says, just wait. Wait until eternity. And you're gonna see what I did with that prayer that you asked. And so when we come to prayer, they said, we come to prayer knowing that God is in control, that he is capable, that he can do all things. But the other thing we know is that God is good. And whatever he does, he does the right thing. And so he may not have aligned his will with our will when we were praying those things, but it did not change our thought that whatever he chose was good because he's a good God who's really good at being God. So God may answer yes. God may answer no. God may answer, why don't you wait and see what I did? And they even said, you know, Kurt, we actually consider ourselves lucky. And I said, that's faith. Saying, God, I'm leaning in, trusting you to do what only you can do. And so wherever you're at in that process, know that God is faithful and good. Well, we go on with that story in Mark chapter nine and Jesus does drive out that spirit and he heals that boy. And then he goes indoors and it says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, well, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, well, this kind can only come out by prayer. You see, these disciples, they'd been following Jesus for almost three years with the idea, Jesus, you're the rabbi, we're the disciple. You're the teacher, we're the students. Our whole goal here is to become like you so that when we graduate, we get to do what you can do. Why could you do it and we couldn't? And he said, exactly, because I'm God and you're not. Here's what you need to understand. You are not God, but you are connected in communion through prayer with the God who is in control. You see, we try to fix everything within our sphere. If we just had the right amount of money, if we just had the right connection, if we just had the right program, if we had the right doctor, whatever, and those are good things. We try to seek help, 
But at some point, you need to realize that prayer is saying, God, you're God. I'm not. I need you to do this miracle in my life. This is a tough prayer. It's us leaning into God in church. Would we become a church when we are faced with things that feel impossible? Remember that God has given you one of the most incredible gifts, and that is the ability to commune with the creator of the universe. He doesn't just rule over the world. He cares about each one of us individually. That's a personal God. And he doesn't just be distant from his creation. He's actively working in his creation. And he wants to hear from you, and he wants to hear your desires in your heart. And when you come to him, you approach him going, you are a really good God who is good at being God, and I will trust you with my prayers, expecting that you will do what you will do, but hoping that you will align with my will. That's tough prayers. 